The views expressed on the following program do not necessarily match those of WPSL. However, we are the ones that encourage you to like and share them on social media. Because it's time for the Sue Ellen Sanders Show on WPSL. Welcome to the Sue Ellen Sanders Show. And I'm here. Uh, we've talked on and off with Ann Posey, who's my guest, basically over the last 22 years. I think it has been that long. Um, and uh, back in the day when Ann worked locally as a licensed mental health counselor, um, and she still has those initials behind her name, uh, we had her on back when the show was three days a week. There were sometimes I had her on at least once a month because I treated and as my personal uh, <laughs> mental health counselor. <laughs> and you were very tolerant of it. I mean, you, you dealt with all sorts of issues with me because I assume that as a youngish mom um, or a mom with young children, let's put it that way, that probably there were other people dealing with some issues. So over the years, Anne has given us advice on all sorts of mental health issues, um, including stress around the holidays, um, including stress in any other way, <laughs> um, when to know when depression is serious, um, how to deal with teenage children, um, how to deal with the pandemic, um, and today we're going to be talking about um, mental health, but especially as it applies to children and to dealing with our children and other people's children who have to deal with violence on, a, on an everyday basis. Um, so anyhow, Anne is actually Regional Administrator for Behavioral Health with Cleveland Clinic of Florida. And uh, she... Hospital, hospital systems um, within the Cleveland Clinic, Florida region. And as the regional administrator, do you work specifically with other mental health counselors or mental health professionals? I do, um, certainly at our behavioral health center. So we have a behavioral health center in Vero Beach. It's a 46 bed hospital. Um, we have psychiatrists. They Well, the pandemic is definitely something that has contributed to everybody's mental health needs. But, you know, right now, and I would say this week, but there's no this week about it. It's every week. It's, it's every month. It's every year. We're also dealing with, uh, with violence that we are seeing in every town, in every state, and even if it doesn't personally happen to you, it personally affects us all. 
Absolutely. I mean, the, the things that we see in the media and, you know, the fact that we're such a media-driven society. So we, um, you know, we have, um, you know, TikTok and we have Instagram and Facebook and the evening news. And, you know, we're kind of inundated with, with all the events that happen. And, you know, th just, just weeks ago, uh, there was a, a school incident in Valdi, Texas, and um, that was when I reached out to Ann um, because it was it was heavy on my mind um, because and everybody does this I know you find the commonalities in a crisis in a situation you find there by the grace of God situations and you know talking to Cliff before the show started and for six years I was a teacher I was a school teacher and two of those years I taught fourth grade mm -hmm. um, but I was also a parent of children um, who I, I think the th one of the things that struck a chord a familiar chord with me was that the teachers were showing a movie because it was after the the award ceremony and a lot of the class had gone home. Uh, thankfully, some of the class had gone home, but I remember both as a teacher and a parent, when your kids are little, maybe they fight for um, going home with you after the award ceremony if you come to the award ceremony in the morning earlier in the year but those last few days of the year those kids are are saying oh no mom dad i don't want to go home with you even if you offer because this is my last chance to hang with my friends mm -hmm. and besides which we're going to watch a movie we're going to have a good time the teacher's not going to mind if we talk and I, I don't know. I'm sure you have seen the coverage most recently of, of the teacher that survived and his story um, about what went on the day to day events, the hour to hour, the minute to minute events and um, that 11 of 11 children who had stayed in his classroom had died. and. You know, when it hits a personal chord like that, and it, then then you start to feel like it could happen to your classroom. It could happen to your kid. It could well, happen, it could happen, to, your happen to me. So there was just the shooting in um, um, can't remember where it was exactly, but the hospital in the hospital shooting, shooting yeah. right? Um, you know, I I spend a lot of time with the orthopedic doctors, so you know that one hit close to home for me. So it does. So I think when we see these tragedies play out, you know, and we can identify them, it certainly makes it very real for us. And when you personalize the tragedy, it makes it real for you, but at the same time, it makes it that much more frustrating when you feel like things aren't getting done. And I don't mean to get political in this show. That's not the plan. The plan is to talk about what we can do to, to, we can't, I don't know how to say this. I, I, I can't say we can change things because the only place that we can change things really are, are by voting. Um, but even voting doesn't seem like it's enough or enough of a change. And Then I've also seen, you know, things about, you know, how we're going to deal with our kids. What, what do we say to our kids when, you know, back in the day, we would huddle together because there was a tornado drill or a I storm drill, and and now it's it's an emergency of a different kind. Perspective's important, though. You know, I also think we need to put in perspective that as a country, we've been through very challenging times even before this. This time is very challenging for us because we're in it. But if you think about the civil rights movement, if you think about World War I, World War II, 
you know, um, I can remember um, watching on TV, probably in science class, a movie, you know, of kids huddling under their desks because of bomb shelter drills, right? Mm -hmm. So from a perspective standpoint, you know, I also think we need to recognize that as a country and as a society, we've been through tough times before. We have survived them. We have also made great changes within society. Um, and that can still happen. I mean, you know, I think hope's really important. I know the um, point that you made earlier uh, about the fact that because of social media, everything becomes more personal because mm -hmm. we see it. We see um, the, the parents or the survivors or, uh, but, but it, there, in the past there were places that you felt that like you should be safe, like in the church and in the school and in the hospital. And what is scary to me as an individual and what I hear from friends and acquaintances is they feel like there's no place that's safe. And how much does that contribute to us staying home and not going anywhere and not doing anything and then falling into a deeper hole? Well, I mean, I think it certainly can contribute to that. And, and one of the things when you feel very out of control, you know, or you feel things are unsafe or you don't have control of a situation, is you start to look for areas where you can take some control. You know, what are some things you can do um, to make yourself feel more safe? You know, or is there something you can educate yourself on? you know, as far as feeling safe. Um, the reality is bad things can happen to us anytime. I mean, even if it's not a shooting, even if it's not a pandemic, you know, there are tragedies that happen and we don't necessarily isolate ourselves because, I mean, you and I get in a car every day. People die in car accidents every day, but we get in a car every day because we feel we have some sense of control over that. Right. right. We, right. we take safe driver courses. We make sure that we're as safe as can be. We, we wear get our seatbelt. Right. We get safe vehicles. Yeah. So we get that that control. Um, you know. So so I think looking for those areas where you can get some control is important. Um, looking for those areas with the ability for you to control is one thing, but. How does it affect your mental health to know that you're trying to make a difference? Like, for example, um, I know both you and I are big fans of Matthew McConaughey. Mm -hmm. um, and just everything he does makes me love him more. Um, but, you know, recently he's been on... Uh, in D.C. Uh, testifying mm -hmm. and visiting congressmen and trying to make a difference. And, of course, being uh, born and raised in Uvalde, um, he, as a native, he talked to a bunch of the parents. He dealt with it. But he just, he just didn't go and put his arms around them and said, I'm so sorry for your loss. Um, he immediately is taking action. action. Mm -hmm. So when we feel immobilized, when we feel fearful, when we see, feel sad, action can be very helpful, you know. Um, so we've talked about worry before, the difference between worry and being obsessive. So being obsessive is when you worry about something without action. You know, oh my gosh, I have a lump on my neck. I wonder what it is. It might be cancer. And you worry about that for days and days and days, but you never make a doctor's appointment. Um, so that becomes obsession or rumination. Worry is healthy. We should be worried about a lot of things, um, but we should put action behind it. So what can I do to solve the problem? And uh, s sometimes it feels like, oh, often it feels like that you move from solving one problem to another, and it's especially true at 2 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> um, my husband said something interesting the other day, and I told him that I didn't sleep at night, and he said, will anything change because you didn't sleep mm -hmm. all night? Will, will that change anything at all? Will there be a different outcome because you worried about it? Um, 
and then I slept like a log the next <laughs> night because yeah. that's I, called that's actually called cognitive reframing yeah so that's looking at something and reframing how you think about it you know so you know I'm very worried I'm frightened I can't sleep and then reframing that is this doing anything for me is this helpful you know can, how can I reframe my thoughts so that you know this this worrying that isn't helpful um, doesn't keep me up all night um, if you are, you, you, there's a lot of things on people's plates mm -hmm. to worry about. There's just like everyday things to worry about. And, you know, we've talked about the pandemic before and uh, about the fact that there are still some people who are um, reacting slowly mm -hmm. to come out and be a part of society and do their everyday thing. And there's still some people who haven't stopped for a moment, and yet, for some reason, they didn't get COVID. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, it are people, I almost envy those people who have gone ahead with their lives because they didn't have that break that makes it so hard to get back out there and do things. I mean, right. Our routines have changed for a lot of people. Routines have changed. Um, and, and that's where small steps I think are, are important. So if you've been staying home and you haven't been going out, you know, I don't think that you then go out seven nights a week, right? But maybe once every two weeks you go out to a restaurant and you eat outside, um, you know, and you make those small steps. Um, but I also don't, I don't know that it's important for people to do things that make them uncomfortable, you know. So we're, we're a different world than we were two years ago. I don't know, you know, I've been thinking about going to the theater and seeing Top Gun. And then I'm thinking, I'm, I, I, I'm not sure I'm going to do that. I may just wait till it comes out and watch it on my TV at home. And, and that's okay. You know, why, why do I have to go back to the yes. movie theater? Yep. You know? Or you could go at a time where nobody's mm -hmm. there at a theater that nobody right. goes I to. I don't think I'll ever shake hands again. I, you know. And, and people's <laughs> habits have changed, yeah. changed with that, too. And that's okay. I, and I think that's where we get lost a little bit is that somehow those things aren't, it isn't okay to change and adapt given the circumstances, but it is okay. Uh, a friend of mine who has been extremely cautious for three years, <laughs> like like to the point of, of becoming a hermit and got every vaccination as soon as the vaccinations were okay, went to a family wedding mm -hmm and um, felt very comfortable about the family wedding that was out of town. And um, because before the rehearsal dinner where people got together and before the wedding, everyone had to test. Mm -hmm. They had to show that they'd been vaccinated and everybody had to, to test. And at the wedding itself, one of the other relatives from out of town uh, was, going around announcing to to people that she had figured out a way around testing um, of what you could do if you had COVID and you wanted to go out and you wanted to fly, for example, and you wanted to go to weddings. And so my friend came home and she and her husband got COVID and 100 out of 200 people at the wedding mm -hmm got COVID as well because the, this woman was bragging about it and she actually had COVID and that's why she was bragging about and so I, I think the point that I was making you're never quite sure with me <laughs> what the point I'm making is that despite your best intentions your most careful intentions the bride and groom um, had the testing that was taking place and you're always going to have that somebody and of course it's going to be that somebody who goes around the room and talks to everybody well there's risk in everything and you know i think 
as we live our lives, there's a risk in everything. So you, you take calculated risks and you do the best you can. Okay, so let's move on from pandemics because we've just covered pandemics <laughs> and it's, we're learning to deal, we're learning to live with it. We're learning to, you know, not shake hands, maybe not hug somebody unless you're confident in that hugging or maybe hug them in and then go wash your hands. <laughs> um, but what about the whole violence thing because that is something especially with gun violence um that we have no control over we we it's it's somebody else's issue not ours and we might be stuck in the middle of it we might be just have had the bad luck to have our children stay after the award ceremony and watch a movie on the last days of school or or be in the hospital when a disgruntled patient comes in and starts shooting again it's true i you know there are a lot of things where where we run it and i'm not negating that there's a lot of gun violence and gun violence is an issue i think that as a society we need to look at um, so in dealing with it, what kinds of things can we do to try and cope? You know, so can we get involved? Can we, um, you know, go to rallies? Can we, you know, lobby our, our um, governing bodies to, to make changes? What can we do? Um, so some action is better than no oh, action. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. When we feel powerless is when we get into trouble. You know, and and sometimes just that those little things um, that seem little can have a huge impact. How about those kids? What what are the kids doing? I mean, I'm not even talking about the kids that survived the the gun violence that will never ever be the same because of what they saw. I'm talking about the kids who, despite their family's best efforts have heard the stories because it's not just one story it's the lead story in every newscast it's uh, on the radio when you drive down the road it's something that everybody is talking about and it happens so consistently that it's non-stop so how are the kids and how are their parents able to deal with it? What can they do? I think there are a lot of things you, that you can do. With children, it's important with children to meet them where they are. So sometimes our need to, to deal with our anxiety, we place that on the children. So we talk about it more. We want to educate them more. And they may, not, they may not be as worried about those events as we are. Does that make sense? Right, so we need to, to make sure that we're meeting them where, the, where they are, that we're answering their questions as they come up and in, in a way that's appropriate for their age. How, how do you know that? How do you know? Well, where kids they will are. tell you. Okay. <laughs> they will tell you. So, um, and you'll notice from behavior too. Okay. So, so children, you know, a lot of times the way they share feelings is through behavior. So if children are having nightmares or having trouble sleeping or have regressed in some fashion, maybe started wetting their bed again, um, anxious to leave the house, you know, having tantrums, those types of things, then that's the time, you know, to sit down and, and talk. And you can certainly ask the question, you know, gosh, did you hear about what happened? How are you feeling about that? Um, and open the door. But you don't necessarily have to take them there if they aren't ready to go there. It's interesting about children. So we're talking about gun violence, but children have faced complex trauma for many years in their own homes, you know, through physical abuse, sexual abuse, um, you know, uh, different acts of violence in homes, you know. So we're focused on this event, and this, these are certainly very tragic events, but. There are a lot of children out there dealing with trauma every day. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as you said, the trauma might be different, but it's their trauma, mm -hmm. so it's the most important mm -hmm. thing to them. 
Well, and if we're anxious, you know, our responsibility is to deal with our anxiety, you know, as well as to be there for our kids, right? So, so being anxious is contagious. Can be, certainly. Um, and if we, you know, if we're anxious and we stop doing things because we're afraid, you know, then our, our children are going to see that. We, we are the role models for our children. So we have to, to figure out what we're feeling and, and uh, model healthy coping strategies for our kids. What are some of those coping strategies? I think there are all kinds of things that we can do. Worry, you know, we talked about worry, mm -hmm. right? Um, I, this is a productive worry, productive worry. Yes. And, and sometimes, um, journaling, you know, the things that we're worrying, worried about at a specific time of day, you know, so from four to four 30, I'm going to write down all my worries and I'm going to journal and I'm going to try and come up with a plan to see if there's anything I can do with, do for them. If there's nothing I'm going to do for them. I'm going to shut the book and let them be right. So, so doing those kinds of things, do, being patient with ourselves. You know, we don't, we don't have to accomplish everything, solve every problem within a 24 hour period of time. And that's one of the things the media <laughs> has done for us, right? So if you watch sitcoms or you watch TV shows, you know, everything tie is it up in, in yeah, an hour, yeah. you know, and that becomes yeah. our reality too. Yeah. So be patient with yourself, ask for help. You know, if, if you're struggling or your kids are struggling, and you aren't sure what to do, see a professional. You know, they're, I, the one gift of the pandemic, um, well, there have been a couple, but one of the big gifts of the pandemic is that we've begun to destigmatize mental health care. Um, you know, people are becoming much more accepting of mental health care and behavioral health care. Um, we're talking about it more, we're, we're making it more accessible for people. Um, it's interesting because, um, uh, dealing with a, a friend of my son's and uh, he was talking about a longtime friend of my son's who's getting some counseling for the first time who's had um, uh, counseling for for drug issues but never for mental health issues mm -hmm. and my son pointed out that his friend wanted would rather be identified as someone with a drug problem than someone with the mental health problem it it certainly has been somewhat more acceptable uh you know we we talk about substance use disorder you know people talk about aa they'll talk about going to rehab yeah. Cele celebrities they're have been almost going to rehab, proud of it right? yeah i've been going to rehab for years <laughs> yeah um but what we're seeing now is more celebrities talking about their mental health challenges you know, and talking about getting counseling. A lot of athletes, I mean, we saw it during the Olympics, um, Simone Biles, you know, uh, talking about her ADHD and her anxiety and, and the different things. So it's becoming much more acceptable and it's becoming easier to access care in a way that's, um, well, telehealth has become, is tremendous as far as accessing care. Let's talk a little bit about the access of telehealth because it's created a situation where people who don't have the transportation mm -hmm. or don't have the time or don't want to have that face-to-face -face meeting can do it through uh, telehealth and do it pretty easily. Most of the insurance age, uh, companies are covering that. They are, and that's another one of the gifts that we got during the last couple of years is the acceptance of telehealth. I just went to a conference around telehealth. I've been a big believer in telehealth even pre-pandemic. Uh, we use it in our emergency departments. It's much faster access to care. But um, one of a psychiatrist said, my new office has become people's cars. Uh, and if you think about, so you think about your working mom and so you're at work and you have kids sports activities you know maybe after work you have weekend stuff going mm -hmm. on you know you're sitting you, in the car and waiting for soccer practice right. to be over yeah right. you know and you can utilize that time now to do a face-to-face -face video visit with a provider you know people who if in the if you're doing an in-person visit you might have to take a whole half day off work in order to drive to the office wait see your provider drive back probably are going to have to tell somebody what you're doing 
but you can take your 30 minute lunch break and see your psychiatrist in your car. Mm -hmm. um, and it's made it much more accessible for people. So what you we're dealing with is more people who are accepting of, of needing mental health counseling of some sort um, and, and also a general public that is more accepting of the stigma that it's out there and that ordinary people might have issues. Well, and I think we're also seeing an increase in um, people coping with mental health challenges. So I do think we're seeing more um, because of all the stress um, that people have been experiencing over the last few years. So you're seeing a rise in people struggling with some type of behavioral health crisis, but you're also seeing the ability for people to admit it, ask for help, and access it easy, more easily, which I think is a great thing. Uh, one of the things, I don't think that we have actually talked about this yet, but one of the things that um, has been on my mind a lot, and you and I both have daughters who actually grew up kind of together, thing one and thing two, <laughs> um, but live out of state, and so we don't see them as frequently as me, we might want. And um, I, I always feel like, I'm not a part of my daughter's day-to-day -day life, and so I don't have a pulse on, a finger on the pulse of what's going on in her life, and I'm afraid if something happens that she'll hide it rather than show weakness to me in a phone call. I, I think that mothers and daughters have struggled with that for years and years and years. You know, I think actually, you know, the availability of FaceTime and being able to, to communicate more often. But I, I think about when I was young and away at school, I might have talked to my mother once every <laughs> 12 weeks, um, you know, because it just wasn't as easy to do. I was living mm -hmm. in another town, you know, um, so I don't think that's unusual. You know, that's part of being a mom is letting go and recognizing that our kids are adults and, and we aren't going to know and be able to help with every si single thing they're going through. If, if you have, or it could be the opposite too, you may be the adult with older parents mm -hmm. and you need to know if there's mm -hmm. something going on as well are, are there things to listen for in a phone call or, uh, or 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 when they're talking about what's going on in their right. their life ask them specifically you know what what they're doing yeah. you know mom you know um you usually go golfing you know have you been golfing this week um, let's talk about that did you did you have your doctor's appointments um, you know, have you been taking a shower? You know, some of those kinds of things. Asking specific questions rather than just kind of a surface phone call um, can help. Um, but it is difficult when you have parents that are, so my mother's, you know, 83. Um, she lives in another state. I talk to her on the phone, but that doesn't really necessarily give me insight into what's going on. So I try to ask very specific questions but if I get concerned, you know, is there somebody I can call in that town, you know, a friend who can maybe go check and give me a, a more realistic perspective? Mm -hmm. Or do I need to get on a plane and go visit um, to really see what's going on? Uh, I, I, I'm thinking of, uh, you know, we talk about being more aware of mental health issues and what goes on, but there's a real proliferation of the real story TV series that are coming out that are about true events where people are have dealt with murder mayhem and mental illness and we're getting a fictionalized version of this real story and all of a sudden the things that you see on TV are everywhere around you. Well, I, I think that the media has never done a great job with really portraying uh, mental health and, 
you know, the, a lot of times the mentally ill are portrayed as violent. Um, very few mentally ill people are violent. In fact, they're more likely to be victims of violence themselves than to, to commit violence on someone else. Um, we don't use um, person first language, you know, where we, we don't identify people by their diagnosis, you know, oh, the schizophrenic, you know, or we talk about someone who's living with schizophrenia. You know, I think all those kinds of things go to perpetuating stigma. Um, you know, we talk a lot about um, mental health in relation to all the violence that we're experiencing. That's just one part of the problem and, you know, not necessarily the biggest part of the problem. But sometimes that's where we focus. And it, it, it appears that sometimes mental health is used as a way to deflect other issues. Now, I'm certainly glad for the attention and, you know, money that may go towards mental health care, um, but I think we shouldn't, you know, make that the whole problem. I mean, we just, we have to look at this as a whole. Uh, so, and most, like I said, most mentally ill people are not violent. That is, that is a myth. When you say most, I mean. Er, uh, less than 1%. Wow. <laughs> That's way most. <laughs> right much more likely to inflict harm upon themselves or, or have violence inflicted mm -hmm. upon them. Be taken advantage of mm -hmm. because they're unsure. So, so where do we go from here? I mean, what is... Well, I think there are a lot of strategies that we can use to, to keep ourselves in a good place. Right? Okay. Um, certainly we want to avoid unhealthy coping strategies, right? So we don't want to do things that are unhealthy. We don't want to drink too much. We don't want to put ourselves in situations um, where we're eating the wrong foods or not getting enough sleep. I mean, we want to use healthy coping strategies. Uh, exercise is great. Um, eating, you know, high protein diet is really good. Uh, making sure you have a bedtime go to sleep about the same time every night, get up about the same time every morning, have good sleep hygiene. Um, we wanna spend time with supportive people, right? When you think about how you've gotten through difficult times in the past, because this is a difficult time, but we've been through other difficult times. When you think back in your life, you've been through many difficult times that you survived. So how did you get through them? Who was supportive? Who did you talk to? Um, I read somewhere that uh, if you look around yourself, the five people that mm -hmm. you spend the most time with are the people that you are the most like, or you become the most mm -hmm. like. Um, and so if those five people are all, this will age me a little <laughs> bit, negative Nellies, right. um, then, then what you're feel, you end up feeling pretty negative about things if they're all people who are afraid to go out or, or, or afraid mm -hmm. to fly or um, or or believe in one thing or another um, then you're more likely to be that yeah I think it's important to look for those supportive people those positive people those positive situations you know certainly the last two years have been very difficult for our elderly population and when you talk to them sometimes and you ask them, well, where did you go for support? A lot of them would say church. And when church wasn't available to a lot of people, you know, then those supportive people also went away. So recognizing who are our support systems? How can I make sure that I'm accessing those support systems? Um, how can I help others? You know, certainly it's easier to feel bad about ourselves when we're only thinking about ourselves. And that, that is a really excellent point because when you're feeling at your most low, mm -hmm. if you do something for somebody else who's in a situation that they can't get themselves out mm -hmm. of by themselves, then, then you feel better mm -hmm. because you took some action even if it was to help them. Right, and, and to be productive and to, to rec and to give perspective. You know, sometimes we look at our situation and, and we believe that it can't get any better, but if you look sometimes at someone else's situation and how they've been able to rise through that situation, it can give you hope. 
The, the phrase fake it till you make it, mm -hmm. I think, um, is also applicable to if you want to make a difference in the community and do good for somebody else. May maybe it's not like the first thing you think of. Maybe you you don't wake up in the morning mm -hmm. and feel altruistic. So you look up the things that you really care about. You know, maybe it's animals mm -hmm. and you could help with the animal shelter. Um, maybe it's seniors, maybe it's little kids. Um, even if you're hesitant in going out into the community of people that you don't know, there's probably behind the scenes type things mm -hmm. that they need. Um, going through your linen closet mm -hmm. and pulling out um, all the old towels um, and bringing them to the Humane Society. Mm -hmm. Right, I think you make a plan every day. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that plan, so that plan may be based on where you are. So if you're not getting out of bed and you're not taking a shower because you're very depressed, you know, setting a goal to take a shower every day may be where you are um, and that's where you start, uh, you know, and then adding something else to that list. Okay, so I did that for a week. Now I'm going to, you know, go through my towels and donate them to the animal shelter. Um, but if you're experiencing a lot of depression or, or symptoms that have been going on for more than two weeks every day, almost all day, it, it's worth it to seek some help. You know, um, it, the average person with a behavioral health disorder, you know, say depression, do you know what the average time it is for them to get help? A year? Ten years um, for the average person, wow. right? Now, if you broke your arm, probably wouldn't walk around with a broken arm for 10 years. Right. So getting that help sooner as opposed to later, you know, is, is really important and impactful. I know we've talked about this before, but it's worth reminding how you know when it's time that you need help. How do you know when your arm is broken and when it's just sprained? <laughs> and I'm talking about your mental health mm -hmm. and not your actual arm well so if you have pain in your arm you might let it go for a day or two but if it continues you're going to go you know i'm going to have it checked out it might just be sprained but it might not be sprained so i'm going to go have someone look at it right we can do the same you know especially now with telehealth have a consult you know talk to somebody let, let them know what your symptoms are if if you have a consultation i think i think people that i've talked to um and and seen are concerned that if they have that consult that consultation that means automatically that person is going to tell you that you need help so it's the same thing that we do with other chronic illnesses right uh -huh. So I really don't want to go see the doctor for this lump because they might tell me it's breast cancer. So I would rather just not go. But what we find is that when people get that diagnosis, say of breast cancer, then they can put action to it, right? It's not just that they're worried about it. It's really the same. So some, yes, somebody might say, if you have a consult, you need help. That's not a horrible thing. So let's turn it the <laughs> other way. Will the mental health counselor ever say oh you don't really need help you just need to use these coping strategies sure okay that was <laughs> basically my question absolutely so, so there is a time where people will go hey you, you totally you, so, you got this so really a therapeutic relationship right. it's, it's a relationship so if I'm seeing someone and they say, I really don't want to take medication, I really don't want to do therapy every week, then we say, well, maybe you could try these strategies. You know, so, you know, exercise for 30 minutes every day, get a self-help book off Amazon, work on that. If you don't get better and you don't feel better, come back and let's talk about a different strategy. That happens more often than you think. Well, my... No one can force you, really, to do anything you don't want to do. <laughs> my coping strategy during the pandemic was to watch only comedy romances mm -hmm. on TV. Mm -hmm. um, and it drove my husband absolutely 
buggy. <laughs> He's like, no, no. Mm-hmm. I don't want to laugh and I don't want to see them be happy mm-hmm. at the end. No, no. And that's not real life. But um, sometimes that is a, a strategy that works when you surround yourself, mm-hmm. even if it's artificially, with happy endings. Absolutely. So that's okay. Sure. <laughs> so, so uh, we're, we're very judgy. Um, we are. Especially <laughs> uh, with ourselves, right? Yeah. Um, you know, we, we put a lot, you know, well, is this okay? I mean, is it hurting anybody? Does it make you feel good? Does it make you feel better? If it's not hurting anybody and it makes you feel better, why is it not okay? I don't think I've ever asked you this point blank, but I'm really curious about this. There are some times in our life where we are not happy Mm -hmm. seeing the people around us succeed at a high level because it makes us feel worse Mm -hmm. about ourselves. Um, And we might even get to the point where we don't want to see them succeed or um, or lose weight like if everybody wants to lose weight together and one is really successful about it or or starts to train for a marathon and uh, and and we react by saying oh well you know if that's what you're into, you know, in a you know sarcastic way, um, is it na- natural or unnatural for people to look at that? And well, I think it has a lot to do with our own self-esteem. So ah. you know, um, so really, jealousy has more to do with us than it does the other person. I, I don't know that the word jealous is what I'm describing as much as envious another word for jealous is but it is it <laughs> <laughs> okay so so when you are around people for example that are like the the teachers say for example when i was teaching and uh, there were those who went ahead and got their master's <laughs> degree or are or a further degree and uh, got a job that was something that you couldn't aspire to. Um, did 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 that make you less of a person that you were hoping that they would fail at least one class? <laughs> I mean, just something little. I I don't think it makes you less of a person, but I think it goes. T- you know, I think especially women, we should support each other, mm-hmm. right? And we should celebrate. Um, everybody's success Uh, and if we're feeling that way then what is it that we maybe want to change about ourselves right so Um, so what's holding you know what's what's holding me back from getting that degree is it something I really want you know do I need to feel bad because that person did that I mean great for them it may not be something I want I don't have to live up to whatever they're doing you're right I can have my own goals and aspirations so let's take the reverse as somebody who celebrates everybody all the time to the point where you just want to say to them okay um, let, let's get real stop telling me how much I've achieved or that you love my uh, new house or um, because I'm feeling uncomfortable that you are constantly being my cheerleader. Is there anything wrong with that? And I'm not talking about you. (laughs) It's kind of funny. This is weird because Anne and I have been friends for, what, 30 years? (laughs) And she's probably thinking to herself, is she talking about my new car? (laughs) No, I'm not. (laughs) Um, Again, you know, a lot of times, and I think especially women have trouble accepting compliments, Mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, saying thank you, you know, Mm -hmm. when someone... Um, says that and also maybe you know sharing our feelings you know I appreciate that you are giving me all these compliments it makes me a little uncomfortable Mm -hmm. Um, you know I just want you to know that I'm working on it you know maybe you can scale back a little and I'll try and feel more comfortable but so so let's talk about the top 
three strategies that people can use to go through life in a better mental direction? Well, I think um, with, especially now with difficult times, you know, making sure that you have goals for your day, setting small, achievable goals so that every day you can achieve a couple of things um, and recognize those things. Um, keep your perspective, you know, recognize that as a society, we've been through tons of tough times. We've come through them. Things change. The world is not going to be the same next year as it was three years ago. It's just not. That's not all bad. You know, so keep your perspective and then engage in healthy coping strategies and try and avoid unhealthy coping strategies. Okay, so those are the top three things uh, and, based. And keep gratitude, right? G gratitude forefront. Yeah. yeah. Because there's always something you can be grateful for. Right. It's hard to be grateful and hateful at the same time. Oh, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> I think you have a sign that says that. <laughs> um, so, you know, there's always people that are in our lives. They may be there for a short period of time. They may be there forever that we can have uh, rub off on us. Uh, uh, and, and in general, you'd like to think that you're one of those people that that there the other people want to be around and one of the things i always think about is how do i want to be remembered mm -hmm. how do i want people five minutes from now to remember me or two years from now or or 10 years from now do, do i want them to remember me as a whiner and a complainer um, do I want them to remember me as somebody who was positive and, and a cheerleader for them um, or bent over backwards to try to, to do the right thing? And, I, you know, you talk about goals. You know, maybe you want people to remember you for doing the best you can every day. Okay, and that's pretty simple. <laughs> Ann Posey's been my guest, and she is a licensed mental health counselor <laughs> um, I wrote the initials but I, I've said it for 30 years I should know it by now she is also the regional administrator for behavioral health for Cleveland Clinic and she spent a lifetime dealing with all sorts of mental health issues um, I appreciate you being with me today, Anne, and uh, hope that everybody who's listening has walked away with a little bit of 